subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you never miss any video lesson from Rao's IES Study Circle. Join the official Telegram channel of Rao's IES Study Circle to stay updated and get all the materials on the Telegram. The link to the channel can be found in the description box. Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading from our UPSC Civil Services examination perspective. These are the list of the news which we have taken for today's discussion from the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 21st April 2022. So on this note, let's start our today's discussion from our examination perspective. Now today is Thursday and it's time for your practice question for mains from DNS. So the question is, public-private partnership in Indian Railways will not solve all its problems. Discuss. Now this topic was discussed on 16th March 2022 when the news appeared with respect to MPs seeking clarity on privatization of Indian Railways. Now here we discussed about the various problems of Indian Railways and we also discussed as to how PPP model that is public-private partnership model in Indian Railways would benefit its various stakeholders. These stakeholders would be Indian Railways, the private sector and the passengers who would travel on the Indian Railways. So before attempting this particular question, you can go through the DNS dated 16th March 2022 to have a fair amount of idea with respect to privatization of Indian Railways, various concerns and also benefits. Now let's take the first news for discussion appearing as a lead article on page number 8. Now this news mentions about unfounded apprehensions about this act, namely the Criminal Procedure Identification Act, as the President of India has given his assent to this act. So this news mentions about the positive sides with respect to this act. Now so far in the previous DNS, we have discussed about the critical analysis or certain concerns with respect to Criminal Procedure Identification Bill namely with respect to right to privacy and also violation of Article 20, Clause 3 of the Indian Constitution. However, this article on the other hand suggests that taking measurements for the purpose of examination in order to prove that a particular accused is guilty or not does not violate Article 20, Clause 3 and it is also supported by number of Supreme Court decisions. Further, to facilitate examination and also collection of certain evidence, this aspect has also been provided under Section 53 and 53A of CRPC, which was added after the recommendation of Law Commission's report. So it is in this backdrop, this article says that taking these measurements does not violate the fundamental right of an individual as provided under Article 20, Clause 3. Now, Article 20, Clause 3 mentions about protection in respect of conviction for offences. And the third provision says that no person accused of any offence shall be compelled to be a witness against himself. So how does a person become compelled to be a witness against himself? By providing certain information which in a regular context they would not have liked to provide. So basically taking information from an accused without their consent. So the aspect of consent becomes important here. However, this article suggests that it is only with respect to certain procedures such as narcoanalysis or brain mapping in which consent is required. Otherwise, whatever information is gathered by the police officials or the law enforcement agencies through narcoanalysis or brain mapping without the consent of the accused or any person, then such information obtained through narcoanalysis or brain mapping cannot be used as evidence in a court of law. So it is here where the protection under Article 20 Clause 3 comes into effect, which says no person accused of any offence shall be compelled to be a witness against himself or herself. However, this article says that the term measurements provided under this particular act does not violate Article 20 Clause 3 or any examination which is done for the purpose of proving a crime under section 53 of CRPC or even 53A of CRPC does not violate Article 20 Clause 3 either. Further, in support of this particular legislation, the author has stated that the term measurement in this particular act enlarges the scope for the law enforcement agencies to take extra measurements, including the biological samples and handwriting, to ensure collection of proper evidence from the scene of crime, which may further help the law enforcement agencies to prove the guilt of the accused. And it is in this regard the author suggests 
that the Criminal Procedure Identification Bill of 2022 merely enlarges the scope of taking measurements as compared to the Identification of Prisoners Act of 1920, which provided for a limited scope of measurement under this particular provision. As you can see, the term measurements with respect to the Identification of Prisoners Act 1920 says that it includes only finger impressions and footprint impressions and nothing else that is no other biological attributes. Whereas the term measurement with respect to the Criminal Procedure Identification Bill of 2022 says that it includes finger impressions, palm print impressions, footprint impressions, photographs, iris and retina scan, physical biological samples and their analysis, behavioral attributes including signatures, handwriting or any other examination which has been referred under section 53 or 53A of the CRPC that is Code of Criminal Procedure and the purpose of this particular bill is to authorize for taking measurements of convicts and other persons for the purpose of identification and investigation in criminal matters and for matters connected with these aspects. So we understand that this Criminal Procedure Identification Bill which has now become an act basically enlarges the scope of the term measurement which was earlier provided under the Identification of Prisoners Act of 1920. However, let's also understand what has been provided under Section 53 and 53A of the CRPC. Now, Section 53 of CRPC mentions about examination of accused by medical practitioner at the request of police officer. So it says that when a person is arrested on charge of committing an offence of such nature and alleged to have been committed under such circumstances that there are reasonable grounds for believing that an examination of this person will afford evidence as to the commission of his offence, then it shall be lawful to conduct such examination. So basically the whole idea of conducting this examination is on the ground of believing that this examination of this person will afford evidence, that is, it will lead to solving that particular crime. And here examination means examination of blood, examination of blood stains, semen, swabs in case of sexual offences, sputum and sweat, hair samples and fingernail clippings by the use of modern and scientific techniques including DNA profiling and such other tests which the registered medical practitioner thinks necessary in a particular case. So as you can see it also includes modern techniques such as DNA profiling and such other tests which may be necessary. However, the question or rather the threshold here again is that whether these examination violates Article 20 Clause 3. Now here, Supreme Court in number of cases has stated that this collection of evidence, for example, blood, blood stains, swabs, etc. does not violate Article 20 Clause 3. Only in such instances where information is taken by certain medical process without the consent of the individual, for example, through narcoanalysis, then only in such instances, Article 20 Clause 3 is violated. Now, Section 53A of CRPC mentions about examination of person accused of rape by medical practitioner. So it says that when a person is arrested on charge of committing an offense of rape or an attempt to commit rape and there are reasonable grounds to believe that this examination of this person will afford evidence with respect to commission of such offense and this will help in solving that crime. And here examination refers to the registered medical practitioner shall examine such person and prepare a report of his examination giving the following particulars. These particulars include name and address of the accused and of the person by whom he was brought, age of the accused, marks of injury, description of material taken from the person of the accused for DNA profiling and other material particular in reasonable detail. So basically all these details are taken from an accused or a person who has been arrested to ensure that these details will afford evidence regarding solving that particular crime. So this article says that measurements and also examination of an accused under section 53 and 53A of CRPC does not violate article 20 clause 3. And in support of the argument forwarded by the author, he mentions about the Supreme Court case of State of Bombay versus Kathi Kalu. Here the Supreme Court held that a person in custody giving his specimen handwriting or signature or impression of his thumb, finger, palm or foot 
to the investigating officer cannot be included in the expression to be a witness under Article 20, Clause 3 of the Indian Constitution. So this article says that no person accused of any offence shall be compelled to be a witness against himself. And in this regard, by providing the specimen handwriting or signature or thumb impression, it does not mean that the person is being compelled to become a witness against himself as per Article 20, Clause 3. It further says that the Supreme Court in number of cases has held that taking blood sample for the purpose of DNA test or taking hair sample or voice sample will not amount to compelling an accused to become witnessed against himself as such samples by themselves are not harmful and these samples do not convey any knowledge with respect to commission of a crime. So it cannot be said that by taking samples a person is being compelled to be a witness against themselves as per Article 20, Clause 3. Further, this article has also mentioned that what is prohibited under Article 20, Clause 3. So it says that in the case of Selvi versus State of Karnataka, the court held that only exceptions are scientific techniques such as narcoanalysis and brain fingerprinting, which the Supreme Court held to be testimonial compulsions if conducted without consent. So if these tests such as narcoanalysis, polygraphy and brain fingerprinting are conducted without the consent of the person or the accused, then such evidence cannot be used in a court of law. And that's why these scientific techniques are prohibited under Article 20, Clause 3 of the Indian Constitution. Further, these scientific techniques including narcoanalysis, polygraphy and brain fingerprinting does not become part of examination under Section 53 of CRPC. So this article overall suggests that taking measurements as per this act for the purpose of investigation of a crime will not violate Article 20 Clause 3 unless narcoanalysis is done, unless polygraphy is done or even brain fingerprinting is done without the consent of the accused. Now despite this assurance, there are a number of modern scientific techniques which are being utilized currently to obtain information for the accused. So here the author says that validity of any new scientific technique to be applied in future would need to be tested on the touchstone of permissible restrictions on fundamental rights, namely Article 20, Clause 3 of the Indian Constitution. Now there are few concerns or issues which also has been highlighted in this article. And these concerns are regarding the juveniles. Now the Criminal Identification Act does not explicitly prohibit taking measurements of juveniles. However, if measurements of these juveniles are taken, then they cannot be used for future references based on Section 3 of the Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act of 2015. Why? Because Section 3 of JJ Act provides for general principles to be followed in the administration of this particular act in case of dealing of offences by juveniles. And one of such principle is regarding principle of fresh start, which says, that all past records of any child under the juvenile justice system should be erased except in special circumstances. So again the author says that the criminal identification bill should have added a provision with respect to storage of these measurements especially in case of juveniles. Further, the author says that even access to biometrics collected by the Unique Identification Authority of India has been refused to law enforcement agencies on the pretext of technology issues and also regarding strict provisions of concerning law including the aspect of right to privacy. So these are some of the concerns which have been highlighted with respect to criminal identification bill. So this author has concluded that law enforcement agencies should use better technologies as it will not only help in minimizing the probability of errors but it will also help the law enforcement agencies to reach the right conclusion based on evidence gathered, collected and analyzed through modern scientific techniques. However, these better technologies or advancement in technologies must ensure that Article 20 Clause 3 is not violated. That is, collection of any evidence should not compel a person to become a witness against themselves. The author further says that right of an individual will have to be considered in the background of the interest of the society at large. So as a conclusion, the author says that the data which has been proposed to be collected through measurements with respect to Criminal Identification Act of convicts and others does not appear to be disproportionate with the stated objectives of the Act because even according to the Supreme Court decisions, collection of these evidence 
does not amount to compelling an accused to become a witness against themselves now with respect to justice juvenile act you need to know about the following here child means a person who has not completed 18 years of age child in conflict with law means a child who is alleged or found to have committed an offence and who has not completed 18 years of age on the date of commission of such offence and juvenile means a child below the age of 18 years and based on our discussion these becomes your practice question for prelims and also mains so the first practice question for prelims is with reference to juvenile justice care and protection of children act of 2015 consider the following statements first child in conflict with law means a child who is alleged or found to have committed an offence and who has not completed 18 years of age on the date of commission of such offence second juvenile means a child below the age of 21 years and third all past records of any child under the juvenile justice system should be erased except in special circumstances so the question is which of the statements given above is are correct options are a 1 and 2 only b 2 and 3 only c 1 and 3 only and d 1 2 and 3 the second practice question is according to the criminal procedure identification act 2022 the term measurements include first iris and retina scan second biological samples third behavioral attributes including signatures and fourth examination of accused by medical practitioner the question is select the correct answer using the code given below options are a 2 3 and 4 only b 1 2 and 3 only c 1 2 and 4 only and d 1 2 3 and 4 and your practice question for mains is discuss the benefits and concerns of the criminal procedure identification act 2022 recently passed by lok sabha and this question carries 15 marks this this article becomes important mainly from the perspective of gs paper 2 under polity and governance regarding rights issues with this let's take up the next article for discussion the next news for discussion also appears on page number 8 the news says the delhi municipal corporation amendment act denotes the spirit of federalism the interference of the center in matters such as municipal issues strikes a blow against the model of decentralization so basically this article mentions about the delhi municipal corporation amendment act which has been recently passed by both houses of parliament which has merged the three municipal corporations of delhi these three municipal corporations of delhi were the north delhi municipal corporation the south delhi municipal corporation and the east delhi municipal corporation and the delhi municipal corporation amendment act has merged these three municipal corporations into a single municipal corporation called the municipal corporation of delhi according to the statements and objects of this particular legislation it says that the main object of this amendment was to unify the three municipal corporations into a single integrated and well equipped entity to ensure a robust mechanism for synergized and strategic planning and optimal utilization of resources and to bring about greater transparency improved governance and more efficient delivery of civic service for the people of delhi however this article says that despite this good intention of the delhi municipal corporation amendment act of 2022 there are still certain concerns and one of the main concern is with respect to the aspect of federalism and also the fact that it takes away power from the delhi legislative assembly and transfer it back to the central government now the central government believes that it has power under article 239 aa clause 3b whereby it can make such decisions so according to the central government it is very much constitutionally empowered to introduce this particular amendment which has merged the three municipal corporations into a single entity so while discussing this amendment in the parliament union home minister stated that this law is based on power of parliament under article 239 aa clause 3b to make law for delhi now article 239 aa which was added by constitution 69th amendment provides for special provisions with respect to delhi and subsection 3 clause b says that nothing provided here shall derogate from the powers of parliament so it means that parliament shall have all the power under this constitution to make laws with respect to any matter for the union territory of delhi or for any of its part and it is here where the union home minister has stated that any matter also means that the central government has the power to merge the different municipal corporations of delhi so the amendment provides for power to determine the number of votes extent of each ward 
reservation of seats number of seats of the corporation etc and all these powers which earlier were vested in the delhi legislative assembly has now been transferred to the central government further through this amendment the central government has also decreased the number of seats for the municipal corporation of delhi from 272 to 250 so it says that the number of seats of councillors in the municipal corporations of delhi is also decided now by the central government by exercising this very power the number of councillors to the municipal corporation of delhi has been reduced from 272 to 250 So now the question remains as to was there always three municipal corporations for Delhi no earlier there was a single municipal corporation and through an amendment the single municipal corporation was further subdivided into three municipal corporations and for this purpose this amendment took place in 2011 so it says that the Delhi Municipal Corporation Act 1957 was amended in 2011 by the Delhi Legislative Assembly Now please understand that the Delhi Municipal Corporation Act of 1957 was initially passed by both houses of parliament however based on the recommendation of Balakrishnan committee Virendra Prakash committee Ashok Pradhan committee and the Omesh Sigal committee including the second ARC the central government decided to delegate its power and many of the provisions of Delhi Municipal Corporation Act which was earlier passed by the parliament to the government of national capital territory of Delhi and based on this the national capital territory of delhi in 2011 divided the municipal corporation of delhi into three parts namely the north delhi municipal corporation the south delhi municipal corporation and the east delhi municipal corporation thus summarizing the major problem which has occurred is that delhi municipal corporation act of 1957 was passed by the center however based on the recommendations of the various committees such as balakrishnan committee Ashok Pradhan Committee, Sigal Committee, etc. Some of the powers with respect to Delhi Municipal Corporation and other powers were transferred to the Delhi Legislative Assembly. So, based on these powers, in the year 2011, Delhi Legislative Assembly subdivided the Delhi Municipal Corporation into three parts, namely the North Delhi Municipal Corporation, the South, and also the East. So, based on this, the constitutional question which arises is that if the delhi legislative assembly subdivided the delhi municipal corporation into three parts then the power to merge these corporations must also lie with the delhi legislative assembly so the question which arises here is that that how can the center merge the three municipal corporations of delhi which was earlier subdivided by the delhi legislative assembly so this becomes one of the major contention or issue which has been raised with respect to this amendment so on this note First of all let us go through some of the important features of the Delhi Municipal Corporation Amendment Act of 2022 then we shall also look into some of the concerns so this amendment unifies the three corporations of delhi transfers the powers of delhi government to the central government and these powers is with respect to to decide total number of seats of councillors and number of seats reserved for members of scheduled caste division of the area of corporation into zones wards including delimitation of wards The central government has power to decide issues such as salary allowances and leave of absence of the commissioner. The central government has power to decide sanctioning of consolidation of loans by the corporation and also sanctioning suits or cases for compensation against the commissioner for loss or waste or misapplication of municipal fund or property. So basically if a case is filed against the commissioner with respect to loss or waste or misapplication of municipal fund or property then prior sanction of the central government will be mandatory another feature is that it reduces the number of seats from 272 to be not more than 250 so 250 is the upper limit it removes the post of the director of local body so earlier there was a post of director of local bodies and the director assisted the delhi government and discharged the following functions he coordinated between the three corporations he framed recruitment rules for various posts for the delhi municipal corporation and he also coordinated the collecting and sharing of toll tax collected by the respective municipal corporations of delhi further the amendment provides for a special officer to exercise powers of the corporation until the first meeting of corporation is held after the commencement of this act and this amendment also provides for provisions of e governance system for citizen services on any time anywhere basis for better speedy accountable and transparent administration 
The next important feature is that the amendment omits the provision for conditions of service of sweepers employed for doing house scavenging. So manual scavenging and conditions of service for such sweepers have been omitted by this amendment. So these can be said to be some of the important features for the Delhi Municipal Corporation Amendment Act of 2022. Now based on our understanding so far, let's go through some of the concerns which has been highlighted in this particular article. So the first concern is that this amendment replaces the term government in the Delhi Municipal Corporation Act 1957 with the term central government. Now earlier the term government meant the government of national capital territory of Delhi. However, through this amendment of 2022, this term national capital territory of Delhi has been replaced by the term central government. So anywhere where the term government appears in the Delhi Municipal Corporation Act, it would mean the central government. So it says government under the 1957 Act meant the government of national capital territory of Delhi. So the 2022 amendment will take away powers of the elected government of Delhi and the municipal corporation will be under the administrative control of the center since the meaning of the term government means the central government. Now the second concern highlighted is that the parliament lacks the legislative competence to amend as the previous amendment to trifurcate the municipal corporation of Delhi was passed by legislative assembly. Now this is the same point which we have discussed here that is when Delhi legislative assembly subdivided the Delhi municipal corporation into three parts then how come the center merged the three municipal corporations of Delhi. The third concern is that this amendment goes against the federal structure as parliament cannot interfere in matters of local polls which are within the legislative domains of respective state governments. Now another concern which goes against the federal structure or federal nature of center state relationship is that during the course of this amendment Delhi legislative assembly was not consulted on any matter. So prior consultation would have facilitated center state or in this case the relationship between center and the union territory of Delhi. And this would also have been in line with the 2018 judgment of Supreme Court where the Supreme Court held that it's important to ensure the federal balance between the center and the elected government of Delhi. The next concern highlighted is that the central government has decreased the seat of municipal corporation of Delhi. And this has been done without considering the increased population of the union territory of Delhi. The fifth concern is that it removed the post of the director as this post was created at a time of division of municipal corporation to coordinate the functions of the three bodies and also to resolve the function anomalies arising out of the division. However, according to the central government, since the municipal corporations have been merged, hence the post of the director is no longer required. And in the place of the director, the central government has provided for a post of special officer. Until a new body is elected for the municipal corporation, the powers and functions with respect to the municipal corporation of Delhi will be discharged by this special officer. So the concern here is concentration of power by the central government by appointing a special officer. The next concern highlighted is transfer of certain powers to the center. Now we have already seen this that the central government has also taken over powers from the state to decide matters of salary and alloyance, leave of absence of the commissioner, sanctioning of consolidation of loans by corporation and also sanction of suits for compensation against the commissioner. The next concern highlighted in this article is that the central government has decided to overlook the aspect of part 9a which was added through the constitution 74th amendment with respect to municipalities. So the author says that the central government has chosen to overlook part 9a of the constitution which empowers the state governments to make laws concerning representation to the municipalities. And here the author says that the argument of the center that article 239aa which was added by constitution 69th amendment can be applied over part 9a dealing with municipality does not hold good as the latter is a specific law which will override the general law related to article 239aa. So here the author says that the constitution 69th amendment act relating to special provisions with respect to Delhi is a general law and specific law with respect to municipalities will override the general law. So this is one of the concern highlighted by the author in this article. Now another point highlighted by the author is that part 9a dealing with municipalities was added through constitution 74th amendment. Now this took place 
after the amendment with respect to provision for Delhi. So it says that it succeeded the Constitution 69th Amendment Act 1991 that brought in Article 239 AA. So it means that when Constitution 74th Amendment was introduced, then special provisions with respect to Delhi was already a part of the Constitution through Article 239 AA. So it says that if the intention of the Parliament was to exclude Delhi with respect to municipalities under Part 9A, then it would have specifically stated under Part 9A since amendment related to municipalities took place after the amendment which added Article 239 AA. So these are some of the concerns which has been highlighted with respect to the Delhi Municipal Corporation Amendment Act of 2022. Now based on our discussion, these becomes your practice question for prelims and this becomes your practice question for mains. So question number 3 says consider the following statements. First, the Delhi Municipal Corporation Act 1957 was legislated by Delhi Legislative Assembly. Second, the Delhi Municipal Corporation Amendment Act 2022 has bifurcated Municipal Corporation of Delhi. So the question is which of the statements given above is are correct. Options are A. 1 only, B. 2 only, C. Both 1 and 2 and D. Neither 1 nor 2. The fourth question says, which of the following committees can be associated with Delhi Legislative Assembly or Delhi Municipal Corporation? Options are, first, Balakrishnan Committee, second, Virendra Prakash Committee, and third, Ashok Pradhan Committee. The question is, select the correct answer using the code given below. Options are, A, 1 and 2 only, B, 2 and 3 only, C, 1 and 3 only, and D, 1, 2 and 3. And the practice question for your mains is, critically examine the merging of the three municipal corporations of Delhi by the central government in the backdrop of Constitution 69th Amendment. And this question carries 10 marks. So these becomes your practice questions based on this particular discussion appearing on page number 8 with respect to Delhi Municipal Corporation Amendment Act of 2022. With this, let's take up the next news for discussion. Now let's take up the next news appearing in the editorial section on page number 8. It says, Bumps ahead. The IMF expects India to grow at 8.2% this year. Now this growth prediction is less as compared to the growth prediction of IMF in January which was 9% and the IMF has also flagged multiple risk factors ahead because of the impact of COVID and also Ukraine war. So the IMF has predicted that because of this crisis upon crisis namely COVID and Ukraine war the economic outlook may not be as good as it is expected. And accordingly, in its latest 2022 World Economic Outlook report, the IMF has spared global growth hopes for 2022 from 4.4% which was projected in January to just 3.6%. So the projection for global growth has also declined. Now we have already stated that the World Economic Report is published by the IMF. Now look at these questions asked by UPSC in the prelims of 2014, 2015, 2016 and 2019. And all these questions are based on various reports published either by World Bank, World Economic Forum or the IMF. So first of all, let's go through these questions asked by UPSC and then we will look into the highlights of World Economic Outlook report published by IMF. And this particular question based on World Economic Outlook report was asked in the year 2014. The question was which of the following organizations bring out the publication known as the World Economic Outlook. Of course, the correct answer here becomes A, that is International Monetary Fund. Now very recently, on 15th April, we discussed about the Global Economic Prospects report which was published by the World Bank Group. And this question was asked by UPSC in 2015. The question was which one of the following issues the Global Economic Prospects report periodically? And in this, the correct answer was the World Bank Group. Now, this question asked in 2016 was, Global Financial Stability Report is prepared by. Now, this report is also published by the IMF or International Monetary Fund. Whereas the question asked in 2019 was, the Global Competitiveness Report is published by. Here, the correct answer was C, that is World Economic Forum. So as you can see that number of questions have been asked by UPSC in the past with respect to these reports. So the moment these reports appear in the newspaper, then at least you should know that which institution publishes these important reports. Now coming back to the recent report published by IMF, namely the World Economic Outlook 2022 report. And in its report, 
it has said that the global growth will decline from 4.4% as expected earlier to 3.6%. And this is because of ongoing Russia-Ukraine war, steep rise in commodity prices because of increase in oil prices or due to change in base oil prices and also because of uncertain global supply chain amid the ongoing war. Now, other reason highlighted by the World Economic Outlook report are pandemic-driven lockdown in China, which has resulted in higher inflation and also lower projection by World Trade Organization on global trade. Further, the report says that it expects employment and output to persist below pre-COVID trends till as far as 2026. And here also, it expects a further dip in global growth after 2023. So clearly, the World Economic Outlook report of 2022 expects decline in global growth, not only because of Ukraine war, but also because of sudden surge in the pandemic. And because of this, it has impacted supply chain, which has further resulted in increased inflation world over. Now, with respect to India's prospects, IMF, as stated earlier, has reduced India's GDP projections from 9% to 8.2% presently. However, the editorial says that this projection is still high as compared to projections given by other international institutions like the World Bank, which predicts India's growth to be at 8% and Asian Development Bank, which predicts India's growth to be at 7.5%. So here, the IMF in its World Economic Outlook report has predicted India's growth to be 8.2%. Further, IMF expects India's retail inflation to now average above the RBI's tolerance threshold at 6.1%. And the IMF has also stated that India's current account deficit will touch 3.1% this fiscal year. So this means higher borrowings by the government. And the reason for this is higher oil prices, higher inflation in the economy, weak domestic demand, and also decline in overall exports. So the question is, what needs to be done? So according to IMF, there is a need to boost domestic consumption by maintaining attractive interest rate by the central bank, in the case of India, the RBI. And there is also a need to devise medium-term monetary and fiscal action plan or policies to overcome crisis upon crisis, namely the COVID crisis and also the impact of Ukraine war, which has not only increased fuel prices in the world, but is also responsible for increased inflation in the economy. So in this editorial, you need to know about the general perception of World Economic Outlook report published by IMF and also other important reports published by other important institutions. With this, let's take up the next news analysis. Now let's take up our last two news appearing on page number 12. Now both these news should be seen mainly from the prelims perspective and also in the mains this topic gets covered under GS paper 3 with respect to security. So the first news here is Navy chief unveils joint navigation chart in Maldives and Maldives appreciates assistance of Indian Navy. So this news highlights the first visit of India's chief of naval staff and in this regard INS Satlaj has been currently deployed to Maldives for undertaking joint hydrographic survey under the Memorandum of Understanding on Hydrographic Cooperation between India and Maldives. Now, hydrographic survey or bathymetric survey refers to the survey of physical features which are present under water. And we can say that this is the science of measuring all factors beneath water which affects the marine activities like dredging, marine constructions, offshore drilling, etc. And it is mainly carried out by means of sensors, sounding or electronic sensor system for shallow water. Now following can be said to be the applications for hydrographic surveying. These includes engineering for dock and harbor, irrigation, river works, land reclamation, water power, flood control and even sewage disposal. Further, the following are uses of hydrographic survey. These include finding out depth of the seabed, determining of shorelines, preparation of navigation chart, locating severe fall by measuring direct currents, locating mean sea level, identifying irregularities and also silting of the riverbed or the ocean bed, measuring river and stream discharge system, and also for planning massive structures like bridges or even dam harbors with respect to deep oceans. Further, the Chief of Naval Staff also unveiled the first navigation chart jointly produced by India and Maldives and also handed over hydrography equipment to consolidate 
organic capabilities of the Maldives National Defence Forces. Now earlier during the pandemic, both India and Maldives have worked very closely under the Sagar mission and also under Operation Samudra Setu. And both these missions were towards resource mobilization and movement of personals during the COVID pandemic. Now regarding bilateral cooperation in defense and maritime domain, both India and Maldives share common perspectives on maritime security issues in the Indian Ocean and both have been working closely in several bilateral, minilateral and multilateral forums such as Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and also Colombo Security Conclave. Now the visit of India's Chief of Naval Staff was further consolidated through the Prime Minister's vision of 5S. Now this 5S vision of the Indian Prime Minister is that of Samman, that is respect, Samvad, that is dialogue, Sehyog, cooperation, Shanti, that is peace and Samriddhi, that is prosperity. And this 5S vision has consolidated the strong and long-lasting bilateral relations between India and Maritime and it has also helped to identify new avenues to expand the scope of bilateral cooperation in defence and maritime domain. So from your prelims perspective, you need to know that both India and Maldives have jointly produced the first navigation chart and both countries participated under Mission Sagar and also Operation Samudra Setu. Further, both India and Maldives are working closely in various multilateral forums such as Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and also Colombo Security Conclave. The next news under page number 12 is Six Scorpion Takes to Water and the sixth scorpion is INS Vakshir. So, the sixth and last submarine under India's Navy Calvary class submarine of Project 75 has been launched, namely INS Vakshir. Now, the other submarines under Project 75 are INS Calvary, INS Khanderi, INS Karanj, INS Vela and INS Vagir. So, the Calvary class submarine is a class of diesel-electric attack submarines based on Scorpion class submarine which is built for the Indian Navy. Now, these Calvary class submarines are capable of offensive operations across the entire spectrum of naval warfare including anti-surface warfare, anti-submarine warfare, intelligence gathering, mine laying and also area surveillance. The Calvary class is also fitted with anti-torpedo decoys for self-defense and the weapon systems and sensors are integrated with submarine tactical integrated combat system. Now, these Calvary class submarines also has a sonar system which is capable of low frequency analysis and ranging which enables them long range detection and classification of objects. Now these submarines under project 75 are designed by French naval defense and energy company DCNS and are being manufactured by Mazgaon Dock Limited in Mumbai. So in this news you need to know about project 75 and the Scorpion class submarines namely INS Calvary, INS Khanderi, INS Karanj, INS Vela, INS Vagir and the recently launched INS Vakshir. And another important point is that these Calvary class submarines are designed by French Naval Defence and Energy Company and are being manufactured by Mazgaon Dock Limited in Mumbai. So with this discussion let's take up the question for the day. Now based on our discussion, this becomes your practice question for the day. The question is, which of the following reports are published by International Monetary Fund, that is IMF? Options are, first, World Economic Outlook, second, Ease of Doing Business, third, World Development Report, and fourth, Global Financial Stability Report. So the question is, select the correct answer using the code given below. Options are A, 1 and 2 only, B, 2 and 3 only, C, 1 and 3 only, and D, 1 and 4 only. Now coming to the answer of yesterday, the question was when a new state is created under Article 3, which of the schedules of the Indian constitution are also amended? Now options were Schedule 1, Schedule 2 and Schedule 7. So in this the correct answer would be Schedule 1. So here the correct answer was A, that is 1 only. With this we come to an end to today's discussion. Thank you for watching DNS.